Okay, I am now recording the meeting, so um, keep comments reasonable. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, can everyone see? Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, these slides were made by a previous TA and they are very dense. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through like three slides at a time, maybe maximum, and then I'm going to draw stuff on my iPad to kind of like make it make sense. And then I'm going to go back to the slides because these are really hard to stomach. Like this information is not easy to digest. Um, okay, so let's get started. The first thing that we're going to be talking about is a single source, single source shortest path. So when you've heard Dijkstra's algorithm, this is a solution. And the single source shortest path is the problem to which Dijkstra is the solution, right? So if we're given a graph, which is, you know, again, a set of uh, weighted edges um, and, you know, connecting, you know, V nodes, right? Um, what is the shortest path from a single node to all of the other nodes? Well, that problem gets answered with uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, which... Uh, looks like this. And again, this is super dense information. So I'm going to give you all just like the high level overview first. Um, so uh, in this example that we have, this picture down here of this graph, as you can see, it's like a weighted set of edges where we've got, you know, a set of vertices, which is V, and then a set of edges, which is E. And diagrammed out, you can see that we've got like so on and so forth connections. Uh, one important thing to note about the single single source shortest path problem is that the optimal solution actually depends on um, some properties of this graph. So if we are uh, allowed to have a graph that has like potentially negative cycles, then Dijkstra's algorithm doesn't work. So the first thing that we're going to look at today, so imagine we've got a graph with, let's just arbitrarily say that we have no negative paths. What is the shortest path from one node to all of the other nodes? Well, Dijkstra's algorithm uh, helps us figure that out. And this is some pseudocode for Dijkstra's algorithm. So uh, we define Dijkstra uh, given some graph G, some set of weights W and some node S. And I think S stands for source, I would imagine. Uh, we initialize everything in the graph. So I guess that's that's like saying like, you know, get the graph ready to be traversed, do whatever you need to do code wise. Um, uh, S, capital S is going to be like, I think the set that is our answer or something like that. I don't know. The pseudocode is very dense. Um, and then we're going to initialize a priority queue to contain all of the vertices that exist in V. And again, like, sorry for this being so dense. The little V means vertex. I think capital V means vertices where V is the vertices in capital G, which is the graph. Uh, and then while the priority queue has elements within it, we are going to pop the minimum element from the priority queue. Uh, we're going to include that minimum element in our set. And then for each vertex, uh, little case, little case V from the, uh, from the node U, which we just popped, we are going to iterate. And upon each iteration, we are going to relax the edge from the node U to the vertex V uh, with set of weights W. And if the relaxation occurs, then we update the priority queue and we repeat until it's done. So again, I'm I'm so sorry for spitting so much information at you. That's a lot to take in, a lot of strange symbols. Like I think it's what GWS, capital S, uh, Q, lowercase V, uppercase V, um, R. Yeah, it's, it's a mess. So don't worry about this yet. Um, I'm going to explain it thoroughly in English, and I think that'll make this make more sense. We're going to come back to this. Uh, it The pseudocode I showed you on the last slide referenced, uh, you know, some mysterious relax function, and that's formalized as this. So relax takes in U, which is some node, V, which is another node, uh, and W, which is a set of weights. And it's essentially saying, starting at node U, look at the edge from U to V, and then if the shortest path to node V is greater than shortest path to node U plus the minimum 
well, I guess not the minimum, but the weight from U to V, then we have to update what we currently know to be the shortest path. If that happens, we return true. Otherwise, we return false. And again, this is super dense. I think you'll need like an actual example to make this make sense. So I'm going to switch to my iPad. Uh, let's see. Okay. So uh, y'all can see my iPad, correct? Would someone uh, volunteer to unmute? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let's run Dijkstra's algorithm by hand and let's uh, describe what's happening in English. And hopefully that'll give us some uh, information as to like, what all of that nonsense was that we just saw in the last slide. So uh, from one of the slide decks from one of the previous TAs, there's this graph, which I'm going to I'm going to copy down and then we're going to solve it. So imagine this is our graph, right? We've got V and E, V being our vertices uh, and then E being our edges. And let's assign weights to these edges. So let's just arbitrarily say uh, that the connection from A to C has a weight of three. And you could think like in a real world problem, uh, this might be like physical distance, right? Like if you're building bridges or you, you've got like databases or servers that are connected to each other, you might have like a different way to interpret what this expense is. But for now, from an abstract sense, uh, let's imagine that this is our graph. And so imagine we say that we're going to start with uh, A is going to be our single source. So how do we find the uh, single source shortest path and notice because i didn't add any negative weights we can actually use dijkstra's algorithm to answer this question so essentially re again restating the question starting from node a what is the most efficient way to get to any other given node and the answer to this is going to be uh, it's going to be some kind of tree that we're going to see you know uh it's going to end up developing like that. Um, and that's going to be the answer to the shortest path. Uh, and let's go ahead and run Dijkstra's. So to run Dijkstra's algorithm, um, I like to do it like this. I like to make a little table just to kind of track what's happening, uh, where first you have like, this stands for like iteration number, which this will just, you know, uh, what? Oops, I messed up, sorry. Uh, yeah, so this will track iteration number, which, you know, will be pretty clear. Pop is going to track what's happening with that priority queue that I referenced briefly. And then we're going to list the shortest known path to each of our nodes. So uh, we're going to start at iteration zero. This one is actually special. Iteration zero is like what happens uh, kind of like before the loop, where we initialize all of the shortest paths to all of the nodes. Okay, so um, the first thing that we do uh, for each iteration is we pop the minimum of the nodes in the queue. And so our queue, this is this is our queue. This is our priority queue. It's going to contain all of the nodes that we have uh, yet to visit and establish like this is the shortest path. So at the moment, the priority queue is gonna have zero at the highest priority because it is the minimum element. So for the first iteration, we're going to uh, pop the highest priority element, which in this case is A, uh, which, you know, looking at this graph kind of makes sense because the shortest path on this graph that we've found, we found so far is A to itself. So if you're at A, you're already there. Path of zero seems fine. And so next what we do is after we've popped U, we look at all of the places that we can find starting at U or whatever the minimum element is, and we update the known paths to those nodes. So for instance, A can see, uh, A can see B, right? And so A can reach B with a weight of six. And I'm gonna denote that we found B from A with the superscript right here. Uh, A can find C with uh, an expense of three. So three from A. And then A can also find D with an expense of seven. Right. And so that completes one iteration of the for loop. And we're going to just do this over and over again. So uh, now this this is now Q, right? 
This is the amount of nodes that we have yet to place on our single source shortest path tree. And so we're going to pick the minimum, which in this case is going to be C. Uh, and we're going to pop that and run the iteration one more time. So the minimum element here is going to be C. So I'm actually going to mark the nodes that we've popped with this blue, uh, blue color. So C. And C can, what can C do? So C cannot get to B, but C can find D. So C, B stays the same, but C can find D in a path of four, right? And so essentially what I've just said right here is it used to be that the shortest known path from A to D was this one with a weight of seven, but now, if you take this path from A to C, and then from C to D, uh, it's three plus one, it's a way to four, we've now found D in a way that is less expensive. And so we need to include it in our shortest path tree. And so uh, once again, we're in this position where this is the contents of Q. So we're just going to take the minimum of these two, which in this case is gonna be D. And I'm gonna draw that like this. And we're going to pop it for the next iteration. So for iteration three, we're going to pop D. And from D, uh, the only node that we haven't seen so far is B. And it actually turns out that we can find B uh, in a path of five, right? Because it's three to get to C, it's one to get to D, and then it's one more to get to B. So we can find B from D with an expense of five. And so uh, one more time, just to be completely consistent, uh, oops. Uh, to be completely consistent, this is now the contents of Q. There's only one element, so we have to pop B. So we have to pop B, and we're going to color in the node like this. So this actually completes um, Dijkstra's algorithm. And uh, let's look back and kind of recap what happened. So uh, given some graph, which in this case is A, B, C, D, we have a set of vertices, which is, you know, A, B, C, D, and a set of edges, which in this case is, you know, uh, six, seven, one, one, three, or whatever those edges might be for your given graph. You can initialize a priority queue to contain all of the nodes, and uh, you can iterate through the most efficient path that you know about at every iteration, which in this case is uh, marked like this. And you can do a greedy search to the next most efficient path and actually come up with the shortest path from a source node to all of the other nodes. So to really drive that point home, uh, this graph that I've made on the left, A, B, C, D, I'm gonna rewrite that, but I'm only going to rewrite the stuff that's in blue. So what did I do here? So only rewriting the stuff that's in blue, this is the single source shortest path from A. So the shortest path to get to B is A, C, D, B. The shortest path to get to D is A, C, D. And the shortest path to get to C is A, C. So uh, that is a quick little baby example of Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, hopefully that'll make some of, the, some of the code a little bit more accessible. Um, okay. So next what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm going to stop sharing my iPad, stop me. And we're gonna look at the pseudocode one more time. So I, I promised that this stuff was dense and that we were gonna come back to it. So now that we've seen it happen, let's take one more look at it. So define Dijkstra to take some graph with some set of weights W and some source S. We, I think, uh, here, this is the next example I'm going to do. Um, okay, so we initialize the output, which in this case is what I drew in blue, to be nothing, the empty set. And then we initialize some priority queue to contain all of the vertices included in V, which we got from our graph. Uh, this was like the step where um, I wrote A, B, C, D, zero, infinity, infinity, infinity. While the queue is not empty, we're going to pop the minimum element from the queue we are going to add that minimum element to our single source shortest path. And then for each vertex that we can reach from the minimum element, we are going to potentially relax that vertex 
and update the priority queue accordingly. Okay, so now that you've seen me do it, I think this code makes a little bit more sense um, talking in English, but still I have yet to really explain what this relax function is, right? So uh, this relax function taking in U, V, and W looks like this. And I am going to uh, let me go back to my iPad. I'm going to do an example of what the relax function actually looks like. I think this is maybe the last mi missing piece. So imagine, I'm going to just draw a little toy example here. Imagine we've got this graph and we can see uh, nodes A and B, and maybe A also connects to D and B connects to D, right? So here's our graph. And uh, let's say that we've got weights um, four, three, and eight. And let's assume that we are starting at A as our source. Well, most of you can hopefully intuitively see that if we were to run Dijkstra's, well, first we would travel to B, right? And uh, from B, we would then travel to D. And this is our single source shortest path, right? I'm going to do that slowly and uh, faithfully so that we leave no stone unturned. And then I'm going to make a point about relaxation. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce some notation. So I'm going to introduce the delta function, which in this case just means, uh, let, let me actually write this formally. So the, the delta function of some node is equal to the shortest known path. Oops. Oof. Known. Did I spell it right? I think. Yeah. Known path from S, and I'm just going to say S is the, the source, to node. So given this definition, we can actually write that the shortest known path for A is zero, right? Because we started at A. We can write that the shortest known path for B is, at this point in time, starting at, starting at node A, we can say that the shortest known path for B is four, and the shortest known path for D is eight, right? Because considering that we're only looking, we're starting at node A, we haven't found this yet, right? And so starting at node A, we know that we can get to B with, a, with an expense of four, and we can get to D with an expense of eight. And so with this in mind, uh, I'm going to actually introduce one more notational trick uh, I'm going to come up with the parent function. So uh, I'm going to say that the parent of B is whatever was the previous node on the shortest known path. So I'm going to say parent of B is equal to A and the parent of D is equal to A. Right, so hopefully this is all fair game so far. Um, and then now we run Dijkstra's algorithm, right? So Hypothetically, at this point in time in Dijkstra's algorithm, we're going to have a priority queue that is going to contain nodes B and D, and we're going to visit the you know, element that has the highest priority, which in this case is the shortest path. So Dijkstra's algorithm is going to tell us to go here. And from here, we need to make a choice because from B, we once again discover a previously discovered node. And so as it stands, the shortest known path to that node is eight, but it seems as if, because we've discovered that node from a different path, we might need to update what our shortest known path actually is. So um, in essence, what we need to do is we need to do this. So I'm going to stay consistent with the notation I showed you on the slides. Let's call this node U, which U stands for the minimum element of the priority queue, right? Because we moved from A and then B was the next minimum. And I think from the slides, we called this next one little case, lowercase v. Okay, anyways, what we need to decide is, is the shortest known path to known v, is that greater than the shortest known path to the element that we just popped, plus the distance from the element that we just popped to this node? So this is maybe a little archaic at first if I hadn't just described it all in English, uh, but I'm gonna go through that again. So essentially, if the shortest known path to some, some node V, which 
in this case is a to d with a weight eight. If that is greater than, or in this case, less efficient than the shortest path to some other node, plus the distance from that node to the one in question, then we need to change what we consider to be the shortest known path. So in this example, um, and this is when we call the relax function, by the way. So in this example, what we're saying is the shortest known path to node D, is that greater than the shortest known path to B plus the weight from B to D, right? And so in this case, we actually have the answers to these values. So we can plug in the shortest known path to D right now is eight. And is that greater than the shortest known path to B, which is four plus the distance from B to D, which is three. So yes, the answer is yes. So eight is greater than seven. And in this case, we have to relax. So um, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense as to what this seemingly esoteric expression really means. Um, but so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and put this into practice. Let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to move all of this stuff over here. And uh, I'm going to move this definition also. Okay. And then maybe do these down. Okay. So let's define the relax function. So let's define. Uh, and sorry, let me, let me just get it out of the way. Okay, I'm done muttering to myself. So let's define relax to take in some edge, and we're going to denote that edge by u and v, where u, in this case, is the node that we're starting from, and v is the node that we're going to. So as you can see, if we have nodes u and v, that in fact defines an edge on a graph. So given some node u and v, if the shortest path to v is greater than the shortest path to u plus the weight from u to v, then we need to update what we know to be the shortest path for v. And we're going to set that equal to this new path that we found. And we're going to reset the parent of v to be u. And if the, in the case that the relaxation, relaxation actually happened, we're going to return true, saying that, yes, we changed the path. Otherwise, we're going to return false. Okay, so um, that's a lot of take my word for it, kind of all in a row. But hopefully, that kind of gives you some kind of head start as to what the actual algorithm, algorithm is doing when we're looking at Dijkstra's. So once again, um, stop me. Let's look at this. So... Dijkstra's algorithm, given some graphs, some set of weights, uh, you initialize the set that you return to nothing. You create a priority queue. Uh, while the queue is not empty, you extract the minimum element, add that minimum element to, in this case, S is like that blue path of the most efficient path. And we, uh, every time we extract that minimum element, we look at all of the vertices that that element has now discovered and we potentially relax those new, uh, those we relax those edges to those new vertices, right? And if relax, uh, if this returns true, then we have to update uh, our heap to account for the fact that uh, we might have a new uh, minimum path, right? Because we just changed the path. Um, and then our relax function right here, like I said before, is if the shortest known path to a vertex is greater than shortest known path to another vertex plus the weight from u to v, then we need to update and say, oh, well, actually, this is the new shortest known path. Change which parent pointed to v, which in this case is u, and then return true for, yes, we have done something. So that's a lot of, I just um, exhaled a lot. Uh, but hopefully, that kind of makes this, this code a little bit more accessible. And now uh, I want to actually do this example. So now that we should be at least hopefully a little bit more comfortable with Dijkstra's algorithm, uh, let's do this kind of bigger example. And I think uh, I've, got, I've got it pulled up. Had it pulled up. Yeah. So um, forgive me for one moment while I actually draw this thing. So 
we are given. And actually, I encourage you all to follow along. So if you have some way of like uh, taking notes here, I think this example is beneficial. So, uh, oops, going to take one second. And then B, I think, went like this. And then, mm -hmm. And, you know, Dijkstra's algorithm could be done on any number of graphs, right? These, these could really look like anything. Uh, in this case, our weights just happen to be these arbitrary numbers. Uh, four, three, four, two. Okay, so this is a bigger, scarier graph that we are now going to run Dijkstra's algorithm on. But uh, we should be experts now. So not afraid. So we're going to keep track of the iteration. We're going to keep track of what we're popping from the priority queue. And then I'm actually going to uh, keep track of the state of that priority queue right here. OK, so the initialization step at iteration 0 is we're going to set A to be the source. And this is kind of a little hack. So for the initialization step, I kind of I kind of just blew through what I did over here. Um, but let me actually explain this. So the reason that we set A to be zero and all of the other nodes to be infinity is because we are storing these in a priority queue. And in a priority queue, all that we care about is that the we want this source to be the element that is first in the heap, right? So in, in the binary heap, it's actually going to look something like this, right? And so uh, we actually don't we don't care about what any of these unfound nodes are, so long as we're guaranteed that this one right here is going to be popped first. So uh, it's a quick little aside. But OK, so now that our setup is done, uh, let's go ahead and uh, fill in the rest of this table. So the first thing we're going to pop is the minimum of the queue, which is A. And then from A, uh, we can see B we can see C. So we can find B with a cost of 2. We can find C with a cost of 12. And I think that's all that we can find so far. Um, OK, so now this is the state of our priority Q. This is Q. And we're going to pop the minimum element, which in this case is B. So uh, we're going to travel over here to B. And so for the next iteration, iteration 2, we have popped B. And so B can see, B can find node C with a path of, uh, looks like 2 plus 8, I think. So we're going to relax that, right? Previously, the known path to C was 12, but we're going to relax this path because we just found a better one uh, from from B. Let's see, C can find node D with a cost of 16. Uh, oh, no, we're at, we're at B. We're at, we're at B. So B can find node E with a cost of 11. And we still haven't found D yet. Okay, so uh, once again, our priority queue looks like this. Uh, let's go ahead and pop the minimum element, which in this case is C. So we're going to go here uh, and in the next iteration, which I think we're on step three. Let's go ahead and look. And uh, just as a little rule of thumb, like this, this graph is going to be missing entries. And we're actually going to be keeping track of less um, remaining edges as this algorithm goes forward. And you can actually, if you if you write the graph over here on the left, like I'm doing, you can actually see uh, visually how many how many nodes still need to be found, right? So on this blue path, that's permanent, right? So we are never going to need, because this algorithm is greedy, we're never going to go find another path to A or another path to B or another path to C. So all that we need to do at this step, uh, I think iteration three that I've noted on the table, uh, is look at nodes D and E, right? So for this iteration, we just need to put something here and here. Um, because those are the nodes on the graph that haven't been colored blue yet. So another quick aside. So from node C, we can reach D with a cost of 16, I think, right? 
and we can reach node E with a cost of um, 13, but I don't think that makes anything better. Okay. Um, yeah, I think this is right so far. So this is now our priority queue. You can see the minimum element is going to be E. So we're going to go here. Uh, and let's go ahead and I think I need to make more room in this table. So let's see, let's pop E. And see, E can find D with a cost of 13, right? Because you got two plus nine plus two, I think. Yeah. Sorry that I'm my, my handwriting is kind of a mess. I, I do apologize, but there is now a path to D, which is more efficient. So 13 from E. And then the last step is going to be just pop D. And uh, that'll be like this. Okay. And so now let's rewrite this uh, minimum spanning tree. So we started at A. And then we found B, and then we found uh, C, and E, and then D. And so if anybody wants to check my work, I'm like 90% sure that this, in fact, is the solution to the single source shortest path, and that this does, in fact, guarantee you the most efficient path to any node from A. So hopefully... Um, Hopefully that kind of makes some sense. Uh, I know it's a really tricky topic. Um, this is kind of an easier example, maybe to get started. This is an explanation of what the relax function does. And then this is kind of a more uh, rigorous example. Okay. Um, so that's it for Dijkstra's algorithm. Does anybody have any questions? Let's see, I see this one in chat. Uh, let's see, Oma says, uh, Oh, yes. So what I just showed y'all, this will 100% be on the final exam. Um, as much as I think graph algorithms are cool and awesome, I'm not just teaching you this because I like it. Like, it th these things are important um, for being successful in the class. Okay, so Dijkstra's algorithm, I'm going to recap one more time. Sorry to beat you over the head with it. So if you are asked to find a solution to the single source shortest path problem, uh, and you know that the graph has no negative cycles, then Dijkstra's algorithm is a potential solution, and this is what the pseudocode looks like. So you initialize a set, which is going to be your uh, shortest path. You initialize a queue, which stores all of the nodes that you haven't found on the path so far. And then uh, in a greedy manner, you uh, extract the minimum element from the priority queue, and you potentially relax all of those nodes over and over again, and the relax function looks like this. So that's Dijkstra's. Um, here's maybe um, some uh, explanation as to why Dijkstra's might not work if you have negative weights in your graph. So if you've got a negative cycle like this, right? So imagine you've got A, C, B in such a way. This is actually not a cycle. So imagine, I, I not to hate on the slides, imagine this arrow actually pointed from B to A, which I think is what's supposed to happen. And A is your source path. Well, then going through the cycle is going to give you a weight of three, a weight of negative 20, and then a weight of two. So it's going to be a, a net expense of negative 15. And because the algorithm is a greedy algorithm, it's going to think that the shortest path is just going in the cycle over and over and over and over and over again, and you'll never exit ever. So, you know, um, that might break it. So the time complexity of the code that we just looked at, um, so initializing the single source I think is S right here, takes O of V time, because uh, uh, I guess it's just going to be an array of V empty elements or however it is that you're storing that information, creating the priority queue, which in this case, like, quick aside, I'm sorry, I'll get back to the explanation of the time complexity. On the exam, you're going to have to be able to do this algorithm by hand, like I just did for you. You're going to have to understand why the relaxation code works the way it does. But there is more than one way to do the Dijkstra's algorithm if you change some things around, right? So if you, uh, like, in this pseudocode right here, it says, well, Q is not the empty set. Q could be any implementation of a priority queue, right? Like, 
uh, in, I think, two weeks ago, this Sunday review, we kind of talked about how there are three different priority queues. There's the unsorted priority queue, which just basically means a list that you find the minimum of. There's a sorted priority queue, and then there's a binary heap. All three of those are valid choices for queue here. And if you use one of those three, it's going to change the runtime of Dijkstra's. But for the moment being, Assuming we're using the binary heap for our priority queue, let's get back to what we were talking about. So creating the priority queue is going to take O of V time. Uh, and you might be thinking to yourself, I thought creating a binary heap would have been V log V, right? Because an insert is log V. Well, technically no, because when I initialized, um, let's see, when I initialized the priority queue, that's, that's like this iteration zero. The initializing the priority queue can be done in O of V because you insert the source as zero and you're not actually sorting or doing heap operations to the rest of them. You're just setting everything else to the largest possible number. Uh, the loop is gonna execute V times. So for each vertex, this loop will happen once. Uh, extract minimum from the from the binary heap is gonna take O of log V, right? That's, that's uh, binary heap PA6 stuff. Um, in the worst case, all edges must be relaxed, um, which this is not going to be in every case, but looking for a bound for this runtime, that means that we might have to update the heap E times. And each update to the heap is going to take log of V um, operations. So hypothetically, uh, we could either run through this while loop V times and extract the minimum, which is going to be v times log v and that could be the most expensive thing that we do or we could have we could have to relax each edge and update the heap for the edge that we just relaxed which is going to be e log v times so the ultimate running time of this algorithm is going to be which is worse o of v log v or o of e log v which we can just write that as a composite runtime where uh, I think it's down here where the composite runtime for the worst case is going to be O of V plus E log V. So hypothetically, whichever one is worse uh, is going to be like dominant in this term. So O of V, because we have to call up heap or down heap or whatever it is, I'm, it's blanking my mind, for each minimum element and there are V minimum elements and then E because we might have to relax every edge. So keep that in mind. Uh, this is top sort. I don't want to talk about top sort. Um, this is an example of what the tree looks like after you've finished uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. I don't want to talk about Bellman Ford. So we don't have time in the review to talk about this algorithm. Maybe go and look through it yourself. But this one, I don't think there's many test questions on this. I think all you need to know is that it's less efficient than its worst case, but it can handle negative cycles potentially. So it's, again, potentially uh, O of V times E. So I think you refer to it as like a N squared algorithm, I think kind of. Um, and then it's potentially O of V cubed and it can um, handle negative cycles, but I don't want to talk about that. So the next subject that we're actually going to think about is minimum spanning trees. So um, whereas Dijkstra's algorithm is to the single source shortest path, uh, crew schools and prims are to minimum spanning trees. So minimum spanning tree is like a, another, it's like a math problem similar to the last math problem. And there are certain algorithms that we, we can use to find efficient solutions. So a minimum spanning tree on a graph, I don't want to actually lose too much text. Uh, a minimum spanning tree on a graph is essentially give, given some set of vertices, find the least expensive edges to connect all the vertices. Um, so this is also a greedy algorithm, or these two that we're going to be looking at. Uh, both of these are greedy algorithms. Um, and uh, some properties of a minimum spanning tree is that it is going to contain the number of nodes minus one paths. So uh, where were we? OK, so for crew schools algorithm, this is a minimum spanning tree algorithm. You're going to continuously add edges to a forest. I don't know. That's not a great explanation of what it is. Um, yeah, this is better. So to implement Kruskal's algorithm, we need to know about disjoint sets. 
uh, as an abstract data type. Okay, so hopefully y'all have taken 222 by now because this is just disjoint sets, pretty easy. Uh, we're gonna rely upon some operations. We're gonna rely on making a set, uh, taking the union of two sets and then finding an element in a set. Uh, and skip this. Okay, so here's some pseudocode. I don't think it's so important that y'all know the pseudocode for this one. Um, okay, um, I think I think there's another I think there's another slide deck that actually does a better job at this. Um, okay, so is that show? So for Crew School's algorithm, we're going to essentially take each vertex and make that vertex into a set where the only element in that set is uh, the vertex itself. And then we're going to rank all of the edges in the graph in order from least expensive to most expensive. And then we're gonna iterate through that list of edges uh, and we're gonna use that list of edges to call unions on our sets. So, right. Uh, the, the least expensive edge in this graph is going to be between C and D. So we're going to do a union between sets C and D, um, like so. And then we're going to find the next most expensive edge, which is going to be from A to E. And we're going to union those two sets. Um, and then we're going to find from A to C. And when we get to the point where we have to union an element in one set to an element that's in another set, we just union both of the sets entirely. And then uh, this right here is going to be not a useful edge, right? Because this is within one set. We're going to find an edge from D to E. But we've already connected these, so this path is not important. Um, and then we find the edge from B to C, which is going to uh, union everything into the same place. And then uh, we're good to go because we have now found a minimum spanning tree. So uh, that's that's Crew School's algorithm. I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, I think I think that's pretty straightforward. But nonetheless, uh, I'm going to do a quick example of it. So back to back to the iPad. Uh, cool. So the example that we had on the slides was uh, something that looked like this. Um, Sorry, find it. Hold up. So we had, I think it looked like this. We got A, um, C, B, D, E. And I think there was these paths also. And then let's give those these weights for three, five, two, one, three, five. So essentially, what we do is you just list out all of the edges. So that would be like this. So A, um, A to B with a weight of five, uh, A to C with a weight of three, A to E with a weight of two. And you just keep doing this um, until you've listed all of the edges. And this might take a minute, depending on the uh, actual example that you're given. I'm almost done. Uh, and then D to E, way to three, and then essentially what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to rank these based on order of least expensive. So this is the least expensive. This is the next least expensive, uh, and then so on and so forth. Three. Right. Yeah. And so now you're going to, uh, in the order of these edges, um, so let me draw this tree down here. So we got A, C, B, D, E. You're going to, um, actually, let me rewrite these in order. So the least expensive one uh, was C to D, and then A. Forgive me, y'all. Um, Okay, and I think I think that should be enough. But so you then go in order 
from these edges and you add the edges that are useful. So if we look, the first edge C to D, the cost of one is gonna be like building this connection. Uh, the next edge is A to E with a cost of two, which is like this connection. Uh, the next edge is gonna be A to C, the cost of three. And then uh, the next edge is D to E. And so we don't actually need, we don't need this edge, right? Because E is already connected in the spanning tree and D is already connected in the spanning tree. So this would be like performing a, within it, this would be like that interset union that I showed before, but I'll get more into that in a second. And then, um, let's see, D to E, we didn't do that one, and then A to B, cost of five, uh, which, is that right? Is it? No, no, it's not right. Didn't look right. I think the next one was B to C with the cost of four. Yeah, and then this is our minimum spanning tree. So like I like I promised, let's see, we've got uh, we've got four edges in this graph with five nodes. So your minimum spanning tree, if you've got a bunch of nodes, right? Just imagine arbitrary nodes. Um, this spanning tree could look like this with three weights because it's always going to be one less than the number of vertices, so on and so forth. And this seems to be valid over here on the left. Um, because we only did use three edges. So let me actually color code these. So the first one uh, was this one. So we connected C to D, and then we connected uh, A to E, like this. And we connected, uh, we connected A to C. We actually skipped this, we skipped this next one because that wasn't useful. Um, and then our last one was connecting B to C. And as you can see, this is our minimum spanning tree. Um, so that's Kruskal's algorithm. And uh, really quickly, I'm going to, I think, speed run Prim's algorithm. Hopefully we have time. So Prim's algorithm uh, is similar to that, except... I mean, sorry, Prim's algorithm accomplishes the same thing, except it uses a very similar method to Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, and I, I guess we don't have time to talk about the time complexity for cruise schools, so this is self-study. Um, okay, Prim's algorithm essentially is uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, except like this is 100% Dijkstra's algorithm, except we don't relax nodes. Uh, and so, again, sorry to be rushing through this. This is kind of like three very difficult algorithms all in the same, all in the same review. So apologies for the uh, the haste that I make. So let's let's uh, let's do the same example that we had before. So I think we had a graph that looks something like this. Um, B, B, E. I think it was, and then we had an edge here and here. I'm not mistaken, the weights were four, five, uh, three, two, one, three, five. Okay, so now let's run Prim's algorithm. So, uh, like I said before, kind of in a hand wavy, take my word for it, Prim's algorithm is very similar to Dijkstra's with the exception that you don't relax nodes. Um, let's go ahead and just do that. So let's run Dijkstra's algorithm or something similar to it. Um, but instead of measuring the path from a single source, we pick a source randomly and we are going to replace what we had previously in Dijkstra's algorithm with the shortest path with the minimum distance, um, minimum distance edge. So uh, let's list all of our different nodes here. So A, B, C, D, E. So in iteration zero, uh, we're just going to initialize all of these things. We're going to start at A, and we haven't actually found any of these other nodes yet. Um, so we're going to pop the minimum, which is A, and that's going to look like this. And again, instead of adding the shortest path, 
to all of these nodes, we're going to find the least expensive edge to each node. So starting at A, A has an edge to B with a weight of 5, C with a weight of 3, and E with a weight of 5. So let's go ahead and mark those in our table. So A can find B, a weight of 5, C with a weight of 3, and E with a weight of 2. And so this is now our priority queue, and we're just going to pop the minimum element, which is going to be E. So I'm going to pop E. Uh, and by going here. Okay. So for E, E connects to B with a weight of 5, so this doesn't change. Uh, e connects to D with a weight of 3. So and uh, see, this is now our priority queue. And in a similar greedy fashion, we're just going to pop the next one, which I'm just going to say is C. We could actually go either way, but it doesn't matter. So for the next iteration, we're going to pop, uh, we're going to pop C. And uh, now we have we have yet to include B and D. So B, we can still find at minimum with five or we can find d with minimum edge one from c and uh, let's see let's go ahead and pop uh i believe should pop d so pop d or d and then the only thing left is b with a weight of five and so let's pop that last. Okay. And if we uh oh wait, no, I was I was tripping. I was I was totally tripping. I, I forgot this edge, y'all. Uh it's my bad. I forgot that that was there. Okay. So from C, when we were looking at C, really we should have said we're still popping D, but we can find B in a less expensive way from C. And so the last thing we do is we pop B, but we do it in this path. Okay. Okay. And then now if we draw our spanning tree again, so we started at A, and then A found E, and uh, A found C, C found D, and C found uh, B. And we can actually verify that this, in fact, is the same solution. This one right here should be the same solution to what we came up with here, um, which I think. Yeah. OK, uh, so maybe I'll have um, let's do a quick summary of what happened. So we looked at Dijkstra's algorithm. And the output from Dijkstra's is the shortest path from a specific source. The relax function. Uh, is part of the pseudocode that you need to understand. We did a more we did a more uh, rigorous example, and then Kruskal's algorithm finds a minimum spanning tree using disjoint sets, and Prem's algorithm uses the same greedy style approach that Dijkstra's uses, but they give you the same answer. So in the next three minutes that we have left in the review, I'm going to maybe speed run these runtimes. So. Uh, if we go back to uh, Kruskal's algorithm, uh, let's see. The operations that we have to do is we have to sort the edges. We have to create a, we have to create these sets that we initialize to each vertex, and then we have to call find set twice for each edge. You know, once on each node for each edge, and then we have to call union. You know, up to uh, log v times. I mean, vlog v times potentially. And this gives us a running time uh, that is the same as Dijkstra's. It's O of v plus e log v. Um, prims should be the same. Um, e, I mean, O of v log e. O of v plus e log v. So sorry that I don't have time to actually prove these things. Uh, take my word for it. But yeah, hopefully... On y'all's own time, you can look through some of these slides, these examples, uh, figure them out for yourself, prove to yourself that these things work. Uh, maybe take a look at Bellman Ford if you're curious. 
do some examples of dextras. Um, okay, well, that was a lot of information, a lot of hand waving, a lot of take my word for it. Anyone have questions? Let's see, someone asked, uh, would you say Dijkstra's is the most important for the exam? Um, no, I would say the most important algorithm for the exam is probably either depth first search or breadth first search, kind of those two. Um, because typically graph problems kind of fall into one of those two camps, usually. So like for instance, on the free response question, if you see if you see a question like, uh, detect cycles in this graph, you know, detect cycles is just an implementation of depth for search. Or uh, if you say, find the shortest distance between uh, unweighted edges, then that's breadth first search. So uh, while Dijkstra's algorithm is cool, and it is definitely a significant portion of the test, it's not as significant as BFS and DFS. So focus on those first and know how to code them too. Because if you like, the way I see it is you either spend like an hour or two before the exam learning how to code BFS and DFS, and then you get to the exam and you already know how to do it. Or you show up to the exam and you use the two hours that you have in the exam to learn how to do BFS and DFS. So it would be better to um, be better to do it ahead of time. See, and Oma says, what we did today, she will do Dijkstra's and she will choose between Prims and Crew Schools. Yeah, yeah. So, so long as you conceptually understand Prems and Cruise schools, you should be fine, I think. I would feel, I would sleep well if I knew how to do all three by hand. So if you could do those by hand, you could understand why the runtimes are what they are. And, you know, maybe write some brief pseudocode. Think about what would happen if the priority queue was switched from a heap to an unsorted priority queue. You should be fine. Um, good questions, though. Uh, Anyone else curious about things? So, okay, well, uh, I'm gonna call it here.